Well, one sermon. Um, I also have the privilege of having a high school classmate with me, Karen Wilmoth Hall. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way other than just welcome you. But um, when, when I heard that announcement, one sermon, it reminded me of a high school story. I was, needless to say, until the very end of my senior year in high school, I was not like a model Christian. I was on, like, I'm sure most of my classmates would never have imagined I would have gotten a PhD, never imagined I would have been a pastor. Uh, I was not on that path until really right at the very end of my high school experience when I had a road to Damascus conversion type experience. And, um, in that last semester, I had an English class, and we had to do a book report. So as a new Christian, I thought, what better to do than a book report on the entire Bible? So I did a, 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 an oral book report. I guess God wanted me to be a speaker even back then. I never wrote anything. If I could ever do anything orally in front of the class, I always did, much easier than writing. So I did a book report on the whole Bible. My teacher actually liked it. He said, maybe next time you could narrow it down just a little bit. <laughs> so I just thought of that. It's, it's too late, but I should have done a sermon on the whole Bible. Um, but at any rate, when I was first asked one sermon, um, I thought, wow, the, kind of the sky's the limit. But immediately my mind went to the Old Testament because that's what I teach. And I really don't read the New Testament. Uh, please don't send any angry emails to Tullian about having a pastor that doesn't read the New Testament. That's a joke. Uh, I said that once in another church and the pastor did get an angry email. Uh, but at any rate, uh, then immediately after thinking about the Old Testament, my mind went to the book of Psalms. And, and this is not a joke. Uh, I have spent more time, both personally and professionally, in the book of Psalms than any other book in the Old Testament. It's kind of like, the, I, I say with a little bit of hyperbole, it's really the only book in the Bible that I know anything about. And then, of course, um, immediately after that, I thought, well, I've got to do something out of Psalm 1 because I've thought more about Psalm 1 and taught more on Psalm 1 than any other psalm. So I'm kind of narrowing it down to my, like my favorite text. But it would take too long to really do justice to the fullness of Psalm 1. So then I just went kind of near the center of the psalm to that picture like a tree. So we're just going to look at one image in Psalm 1, like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. That's really our text for this morning out of Psalm 1. Now the Bible is full of pictures, full of images. We know that the second commandment says, thou shalt not make for yourself an image, but it doesn't, it, it means like graven images of God out of wood and stone. The Bible is full of verbal images of God. Probably one of the best known, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, the Lord God is sun and shield. God is our refuge and strength. The Bible's full of pictures, images of God, images made out of words. Well, the Bible also has a lot of images in it that are about us, that show us pictures of ourselves. And God uses images because they grab our emotions, they engage our minds, they move our wills. And they do that by creating associations. Uh, an image associates one thing with another so that you think about that other in a new way. And this morning, God wants you to begin to think about yourself in a new way. And he does so by associating you with something else. He associates you with a tree, like a tree. If you want to know what God wants you to look like, he wants your life to look like a tree, and we just want to take a little bit of time and unpack that this morning. Now, how many of you think you can leave here with four words, remembering four words? Yes? The rest of you are Presbyterians and won't raise your hand in church? <laughs> Let's try that again. How many of you think you can leave here with four words? Okay, that's what we want to do, and here's our first word, life. Everybody say life. life. You are like a tree. And when we think of the tree, we immediately think of life. Two things, God created you for life. The five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You may recall that when we first enter the five books of Moses, 
uh, we encounter a tree in the middle of the garden, and the tree is called the tree of? Every day when Adam and Eve were walking around the garden, they saw the tree of life. And it was there for a purpose. It was there to remind them day after day as to why God had created them. God had created them for one thing in particular, and what is that? It starts with an L. God had created them for life. Now, if you have a Bible open to Psalm 1, you may notice right before Psalm 1, it will say something like Book 1, Psalms 1 to 41. Now, we could just spend a lot of time talking about the significance of that, but the book of Psalms has been divided into five books. And um, if you go to Psalm 42 and then you'll follow the trail to see where the five books are, that's not of interest to me this morning, but it's been divided into five books and I say I wonder why. I wonder not, why not four, I wonder why not six. Why five books? And there's a lot to that, but what I'm interested in this morning is just to say that there's a connection between the five books of Psalms and the five books of Moses. And that's why there are five books in the Psalms so that you'll associate the five books of Psalms with the five books of Moses in a number of ways. But remember, when we enter the five books of Moses, we encounter the tree of? And as soon as we enter into the five books of the Psalms, in the very first Psalm, what do we see right in the middle of the Psalm? Another tree, and it's a tree of life. God wants wants you to remember why he created you. He created you for life. Now, there's a lot of sin and misery in the world, yes or yes, but that is not part of of God's original creational design. Now, there's a mystery. How there was before anything just a good God, and now there's all this sin and misery, I'll leave that to Tullian to explain to you some other time. That one's beyond my ability, but it's reality. But... God did not originally in creation make everything so that it would be filled with sin and misery. Remember Genesis 1? It was good, 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 very good. That's God's original creational design. And God wants you to always remember why he created you. Not for sin and misery. He created you for what one word? He created you for life. Now, we did kind of mess things up in the next uh, couple of chapters in Genesis, and so we need redemption. God also has redeemed you for life. Now, there's another image in Psalm 1. It's the image of chaff. Is chaff alive or dead? See, chaff is dead. You're not chaff. Do not think of yourself as chaff. Think of yourself as the tree. God has redeemed you for life. Think of what Jesus said in John 10.10. Jesus said, I have come so that you might have life, and not just any kind of life. I've come that you might have life in all of its abundance. This is why you have been redeemed. Not for more sin and not for more misery, but you have been redeemed for life. And that life is a, um, uh, we get a a picture of that life in one word, and that word is at the the very beginning of the psalm, most of our translations have as the first word the word blessed, which is not a word that we normally use in the grocery line. Uh, I, I had thought about actually preaching a sermon just on that first word. Let me give you that sermon in sh- short form. One word, well-being. Blessed, Hebrew ashray, well-being in every area of life. Well-being in your body, well-being in your mind, well-being in your emotions, well-being in your relationships, well-being in your spirituality, well-being in every area of life. That's the abundant life that God has created you for. That's the abundant life that Jesus said he came to give. I have come that you might have life and have it in all of its abundance. That, folks, is heaven. But you don't have to wait. Didn't Jesus teach us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Jesus taught us to pray that that heavenly reality, that heavenly well-being, that heavenly blessedness would come more and more into our lives in this life, even as we anticipate experiencing the fullness of it in the life to come. What's our first word? Life. You've been created for Life, you have been redeemed for life, like a tree. Now, it's not only like a tree, it's like a tree that is planted. 
Here's our second word. Our second word is endurance. Everybody say endurance. endurance. What's our first word? Life. Life. What's our second word? Endurance. Endurance. See, the winds of adversity do blow in our lives from time to time, yes or yes. They do. Now, I don't, now we're, we are not talking here about hurricane force winds that most of us in this room have probably experienced. The psalm doesn't have those in view. It just has the ordinary blowing winds in view. You know, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are both part of the introduction to the book of Psalms. And they paint a beautiful picture for us. And then we come to Psalm 3. And Psalm 3 talks about the time when David was being chased around by his son Absalom because there was a coup against him. Uh, There are winds of adversity that David experienced in the book of Psalms in spite of what Psalm 1 says. Blessed, abundant life. Think of Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? Think of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever been there? Feeling abandoned, feeling forsaken, feeling perplexed because the winds of adversity not only blew in David's life, but they've blown in our lives as well. Some of them are pretty ferocious. Some of them, not so much, but the winds of adversity blow. Now, from from what Psalm 1 says, what happens to chaff when the wind blows? It's blown away. But what about the tree? It stays because it is planted. That's you, a tree that is planted. What's our E word? Endurance. You see, I can't promise you that there will be no winds of adversity. But I can promise you that you can have the endurance to withstand those winds. You are not chaff. You're like a tree that is planted. Now, when those winds blow, the tree does move. You're human beings. You feel it. It hurts. It sucks. You don't like it. It's painful at times. That's reality. But in spite of all of that, you can endure through those winds of adversity and come out a better person on the other side. Remember this fellow named Job. Job kind of had it all in the beginning, didn't he? And he went through this deep dip with ferocious winds blowing. But what didn't he do? He didn't topple over. He wasn't blown away. He was like a tree planted. He had that endurance. He stayed with it. And in the end, what was he? He was doubly blessed. Double the children, double the wealth, double the happiness, double the spirituality. I can't promise you that the winds won't blow, but I can promise you that you can have the endurance that you need to make it through and be a better person on the other side of that adversity because you're like a tree. You're like a tree that is planted. What's our first word? Life. What's our second word? Now, where are you going to get what you need in order to have this endurance. Here's our third word, resources. Everybody say resources. You see, because you're like a tree that is planted by the streams. And the streams are a picture of resources. The tree is drinking from the stream. And uh, this stream is is a twofold picture. It certainly is a picture of the Word of God. In Psalm 1, what's the psalmist drinking from? What's he delighting in? What's he meditating on? The law of the Lord. And of course, that phrase, law of the Lord, to the ancient, they thought right away the five books of Moses. Uh, If you have Jewish friends, uh, they call the first five books Torah, And the word for law in Hebrew here is Torah, Torah Adonai, the Torah of the Lord, the five books of Moses, delighting in the five books of Moses, meditating on the five books of Moses, but also delighting in the five books of the Psalms and meditating on the five books of the Psalms. More broadly, the the whole of the scriptures, the word of God, the stream is a picture of the word of God. 
It's just a simple point, but it's so important. As you stay connected to the Word of God, as you continue to delight in, to meditate on, to drink deeply from the Word of God, you will have the resources that you need to endure the winds of adversity. You see, to endure, why don't we quit? Why do we keep going? We, we don't quit, we keep going because we believe that it's gonna be better on the other side. And that takes faith. Where's faith come from? Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. And so as you stay connected to the Word of God, you have the faith that you need in order to endure through those winds of adversity so that you can experience the abundant life that God has created you for and that God has redeemed you for. However, we are not just intellectual people thinking about the Word of God. That, that stream is another, it's a picture of some other reality. Not only is it a picture of the Word of God, it's also a picture of the Spirit of God. Uh, somebody, I think it was Zach who just said, I, I was joking, they, somebody said, do you need anything this morning? And I said, well, the only thing I need is a sermon, I haven't got that one yet. And Zach said, well, we're closet charismatics, it'll come to you before you need it. <laughs> You know, uh, there are some Christians this morning who say, like, we're the good Christians because we've got all of our doctrine straight. We, we have a very rational, reasoned out faith. Other Christians say, we're the good Christians because we've got the spirit. Those other Christians are just kind of egghead Christians. And these Christians over here say, those guys are just like emotional Christians. But what God has joined together, let us not separate. John Calvin said, there are two things that must always go together, the Word of God and the Spirit of God working in harmony. Now, why is this picture of the stream a picture of the Spirit of God? Go back to the garden. Not only was there a tree, but there was something else that was watering the garden, right? There was a river. And it's an extraordinary river because the text says there was one river, but it broke into multiple streams. One river, many streams. When we turn to Psalm 46, for example, well-known psalm, it says, uh, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of need. There is a river whose streams, notice one river, multiple streams. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Now, there's only one problem with that. Jerusalem never has, nor does it have, a river in it. So that river must not be a literal river. It must be an, a figurative river. I wonder what the figurative river is a figure of. The next verse tells us God is within her. There is a river whose streams make glad God is within her. The river is a picture of the Spirit of God at work in our lives. This is why Jesus in John chapter 7 at the Feast of Tabernacles on the last and great day of the feast said, if anybody is thirsty, let him come and drink from me. And if he does, out of him will flow rivers of living water. And then John went on to say, what Jesus meant by that was the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit hadn't yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. See, the stream is a picture of drinking from the Word of God and drinking in the Spirit of God. And I promise you that as you stay connected to the Word of God and the Spirit of God, you have all the resources that you need in order to endure the winds of adversity so that you can experience the abundant life that God has created you for and that God has redeemed you for. What's our first word? Life. What's our second word? Endurance. What's our third word? resources. Now, if you're tapped into the resources, and if you are enduring the winds of adversity, and if you're experiencing life, there's one more thing that's going to result out of that, and that's an S word. Last word, significance. The last word is significance. You see, because you're not just like a tree that is planted by the streams, you're a tree that is planted by the streams and you are producing fruit. And your fruit doesn't fail. There was a book that was once written and it, it, it sold probably more next to the Bible, probably more than any other Christian book. And it was a book called The Blank Driven Life. The what? 
Why did that book sell so many copies? It's because in our culture, we are really good at knowing what to do. And we're really good at knowing how to do it. We're not just always sure as to why we're doing what we're doing. Purpose, significance. How many of you want to see, you know, like when you die at the age of 150 eventually, on your tombstone, how many of you want to see her life was good for nothing? (laughs) You don't, do you? You want your marker to talk about the contribution that you made, that your life made a difference. I know that every one of you wants to be a person that makes a difference. And the reason why I know that is because that's why God's created you. And that's why God has redeemed you. You are not like chaff. In one word, chaff is good for nothing. But you're not chaff. You're like a tree, you're not good for nothing, you're good for something. Now, we probably come from different backgrounds given a crowd this size, but the the church itself is Presbyterian, and so the congregation as an official body knows our universal purpose. Our universal purpose, why are we here? We are here to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We all share that same universal purpose. But you know, how you live that out and how I live that out and how your neighbor lives that out can be pretty different. There's not only a universal purpose, there's also an individual purpose. We're all unique. By the way, we're not very unique. We're not really unique. Unique is an adjective that can't be qualified. It's either unique or not. So let's drop all the, I love language. What, okay, this is one of my pet peeves. I hear it on TV all the time. That was really unique. Well, it was either unique or not. Okay, and you got the point. You are all unique. Just look in the mirror. Just look at your neighbor's face. How many of you look identical? Even identical twins aren't identical. You're all unique. You know all of those good things that have happened in your past? You know all those bad things that have happened in your past? In the language of one of my favorite Reformed theologians, Barbara Streisand, (laughs) there are no mistakes, only lessons to be learned. If you have not listened to her CD, Higher Ground, it's must listening in my estimation. And there's a song on there that says, there are no mistakes, only lessons to be learned. She's a Calvinist, she might not know it. If God is truly in control of everything, then from an ultimate perspective, there are no mistakes. Nothing that has happened in our past is accidental. God has used it all to shape you into the very person that you are this morning. And if he wanted you to be somebody else, you would be. He's quite happy, thank you, with who you are. When my wife Adele and I and the kids first moved to Orlando, we, Adele heard on public radio uh, an announcement for a concert at the Bob Carr Theater. We were new, so she got tickets, and we went to the Bob Carr Theater to listen to classical music. Now, that's really not my music. I like the blues. That's as classical as I get. But we went, and we went early because the conductor was giving a, um, a little lesson on why he picked the material that he picked to lead. And he was going to do two songs from Gershwin, a great American composer, and two songs from Ravel, a great French composer, and he was explaining this to us. And he told this story, I heard it once, it just stuck with me. He said Gershwin at one point, who knew Ravel, Gershwin, believe it or not, did not think that he was a very good composer. And Gershwin went to Ravel and said, teach me to compose like you compose. And with a stroke of genius, Ravel said to Gershwin, why would you ever want to be a second-rate Ravel when you can be a first-rate Gershwin? Now just answer this to yourself. How much time in your life have you spent saying, if only? How much time have you said, if only I could do what he could do? If only I could do what she does. If only I were more like her or more like him. Have you done that a little bit, yes or no? Now, what if you had taken all of that time and instead of focusing on what you're not, 
you would pour all of that energy into focusing on who you are, the person that God has shaped you to be. Would it make a difference? You know that it would make a difference. You see, each of you are unique. I, you probably love Tullian like we love Tullian and Kim. Uh, and, and some of you probably at times think, man, like he's the preacher. Like he can, you know, there are people, for example, there are people that as gifted as Tullian is, he'll never reach. He doesn't even know them. He'll never be able to touch their lives, but you can. There are things that you can accomplish that nobody else can. You're unique. You have fruit to produce in this life that nobody else can produce. Trust me, somebody that gets up in the morning, looks in the mirror and says, I know why I'm here, that's the blessed life. Knowing your individual purpose in life. Now let me just conclude by, say, by asking this question. How many of you would like to be characterized by abundant life so that you can endure the winds of adversity, always staying tapped into the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and knowing why you're here, living a life of great significance. How many of you would like that right now? Now, let me just say it's easy. It's easy. You, you thought it was going to be hard. It's not. Just listen to the beginning of Psalm 1. This life being like a tree is for the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Put it this way. Um, you never take the wrong advice. You never do the wrong thing. And you never have a bad attitude. It's just that easy. If you never take the wrong advice, never have, do the wrong thing, and never have a bad attitude, you will be, based on the teaching of Psalm 1, like a tree that is planted by streams of water that produces its fruit in season. Isn't that encouraging? Well, I, I know that since you've been sitting under Tullian's preaching ministry, you know that that's a weight that nobody can bear. And that's why that you have to see that before this picture in the psalm is a picture of you, it's a picture of Christ. Was Christ ever in his earthly life given the wrong advice? His ministry started with the temptations in the wilderness. And uh, when he said he was going to Jerusalem, Peter said no. And when he was on the cross, people said, if you come down, we'll believe in you. All along the way, Jesus was given the wrong advice, but did he ever take it? Did he ever do the wrong thing? No. You see, he was tempted in every way, just like you and I are, yet he was without sin. And he never developed that scoffing attitude with regard to his Father's will. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was wrestling in prayer with his Father, when Jesus was saying, I'm, I'm with you about the redemption of these people, uh, but I, I know plan A, I just want to say, if there's a plan B, sign me up for plan B. But then what did he say? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. See, two things in conclusion. Jesus has lived Psalm 1 for you. That's called justification. And number two, Jesus is producing Psalm 1 in you. That's called sanctification. So do, please don't leave thinking, if I can only do better, then I'll be like a tree. Please leave remembering that Jesus has done it perfectly so that you can be like a tree. And that God the Father, based on your justification, views you as perfect trees right now. And he's in the process of making you into those perfect trees more and more as time goes by. You see, you can be like a tree by faith in Christ. He lived it for you, and he's producing it in you. God has created you, and Jesus has redeemed you so that you might be like a tree planted near streams of water that produces its fruit in season. Now, I'm a preacher, and I'm a teacher, so we got to have a final exam. Four questions. You ready? What's the first word? What's the second word? What's the third word? And what's the fourth word? 
May God bless you to be like a tree. Let's pray.